recording right now on, at the uh, National Hail and Farewell um, reunion in Denver, Colorado on August 4, 2007. And uh, if you could, uh, you'll give us your full name. William A. Farrell, Jr. And uh, what uh, regiment and division of company were you in? I was in E Company of 85th Infantry. And in, when I was at Camp Hale and when I went to Camp Swift, I transferred to the Regimental Headquarters Company of 85th. Oh, great, great. So. What was it that brought you, that um, piqued your interest in the 10th Mountain Division? How was it that you came to be a soldier? Oh. Well, to start with, I started skiing when I was very young. And when I was in high school, I was on this ski patrol on the weekends at Wolf Creek Pass Ski Area. And uh, when I graduated from high school, I did, which was on the 18th of May in 1943, the 21st of May, I was sworn into the Army. And, uh, but as I was going through school, or through school, I, I knew pretty much what I wanted to do as far as an education. I wanted to go through engineering. So I'd signed up for the ATSP program, Army Specialized Training Program, which paid full cost education for college medical, aeronautics, and engineering. And so all of us were in this same bracket of education, what we were striving to get to. And we got to, down, we were first up here at Fort Logan in Denver, and then we were shipped to Camp, uh, Camp Walters, Texas, in. It was out in West Texas, very warm, but that's where we took our basic training. And it was a interesting area, because it was really pretty much out in the boonies as far as what was going on, but it very, very hot. But that's where our basic training occurred. And while I was in basic training, they discontinued the portion of the education program and I was interested in mechanics. All they wanted was aircraft or doctors. So I was left at the, after the basic train, I was guarding prisoners there routinely. And uh, one day I walked by the captain, the commander's office, and there was a bulletin. People wanted to go to Camp Hailford's mountain troops. So that interested me, and I did, failed to mention earlier, when uh, I went into the Army, I had three letters of recommendation from forest rangers I had worked for and for ski instructor, and another one was a teacher. And they had written letters for me to have as a reference. And uh, so when I went and asked the captain of my company, if I could transfer to Camp Hale. He said, no, you're stuck here. And I was infuriated and didn't say a word. I went back to my barracks and dug out the three letters of recommendation which I had carried with me. Fired them off to National Ski Patrol headquarters in New York City. And uh, about a week later, I was paged to come to the company office where I was stationed. And he said, uh, the captain said, Farrell, I don't know what in the hell you did, but you're to get to Camp Hale as fast as you can. So I was very pleased. And I got there in September, and we were still basic training type of maneuvers in, and then through the winter, we went on into the winter transition, and I was assigned to a machine gun squad as a first gunner, which meant I, I got to carry the gun around when I wanted. 
for any maneuver. And that wasn't too bad, but they had me on snowshoes to be a gunner, or in the machine gun, or mortars were on snowshoes. So I kept trying to improve things, and there was an opening that came up with the, they wanted another radio man. And I asked the colonel about, or the captain about it, and he said, yes, we could use you. So I became a radio man, and I got my skis in. <laughs> so things were looking better. But we went through the winter that way. I was a company radio man with, with all the maneuvers we had there. And uh, when we went to Camp Swift in June, I was still in E Company 85, which I had the opportunity to get a change my place in the Army because we were getting in horses and mules there, which were assigned to our company. And uh, so I asked if I could transfer to the, the animals. And they were happy to have somebody who was interested in going over there. So I had about 30 horses I was responsible for. And along about this time, a Major Bill Culver showed up and said, Bill, I understand that you know something about horses. And I said, well, I was raised with them. And he said, but could you help me some on riding? He said, I've never been around a horse. So I went there and I was transferred at that time to the regimental headquarters in S2 intelligence. And, and uh, so we got along real well there. And then in, uh, I stayed in that position until we shipped out to Camp Swift in uh, December. And, uh, of 44? Yes, December 44, thank you. And uh, so we got on the trains and went to, over to Virginia to ship it, Hampton Roads is where we shipped from. And. But when we got into Hampton Roads, it was Christmas Eve, about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, snowing a little, no lights. So you can imagine it was really a very, very stimulating place to pick on Christmas Eve. But we got along okay. And I do not recall the specific day we shipped out. It was the first part of January. And we went on the USS America, which was the largest American passenger ship that was being used. We went unescorted, and there were about 10,000 men on this ship. And I was very fortunate because I had to share a stateroom with 11 other guys. <laughs> but we had our own restroom there anyway. So, but it was. We had a pretty good trip because it was, there was some very, very violent weather and there was seasick GIs all over the trip, you know. And, but everything worked out that way. We landed at Naples and then my particular company transferred to a landing craft infantry, LCI. And we went up the west coast of Italy to Leghorn or Livorno and unloaded there, which is right close to Pisa. And we were camped within, I would say, 10 miles of Pisa for about 10 days or so till we relocated further up on the mountain north of Florence, up in that area. And we just were kind of in a holding fashion, uh, fashion getting everybody oriented to the country. And we, uh, weren't in into any maneuvers at that time. It was still through November, or excuse me, January. And then around the 1st of, sep of February, we relocated and started moving people up closer to our particular unit, replaced a, or a company of Brazilians. And I was in the first 
person to go there and make contact with the Brazilians out of our outfit. And, and then I had another man coming right behind me and he showed up and he and I spent about five days staying with these Brazilians. There was about 15 of them and two of us in one room. <laughs> but they shipped out and then the rest of the troops came in to take over that particular spot. And we were down somewhat, I can't give you the specific mileage or anything, but I would say we were probably about eight kilometers from Belvedere in that area. And we were starting to move up and we had to go up with constant followed emission machines working so because we were in an area where Germans could look down on it. And gradually moved up in the position there. And then as people know that our most of them do that eighteenth of February is when they jumped off for started up to Reba Ridge. What was your responsibility at that time? I was basically just as a contact person with the next unit that was next to us further east. And I'd made several trips over to see if we had people in place. And because it's kind of along a mountain ridge and it's kind of difficult to know if Joe blows over there or not. So that was basically what I did there. And then uh, as we went on, after we'd gone quite a ways up uh, Reba Ridge and the fighting got pretty heavy. Well, then they, I was requested to go back to, to E Company Group and go to grave registration and help identify. But uh, that was kind of tough duty. But then we moved on and uh, I was very fortunate for the rest of the whole battle, you might say, through March and April, I was kind of maintaining that liaison with adjacent troops or where we were going to be moving into. So I kind of had an idea of what was happening anyway, which a lot of the GIs had no opportunity to get such information. And one thing that was interesting about it, all this time I was always alone. <laughs> so I was sent running around roads, sometimes under artillery fire. And, how, was but, that, how was that for you being alone? It, it really didn't bother me at that time. I was thinking about it the other day, what a, what a dummy I was. I didn't have any help. But we got things put in place pretty well, and that was how I functioned basically the whole time we were there. At, during the combat, and then when we broke through to the Po Valley, Po River, of course I was very fortunate because I had a jeep, and then all the GIs, were, a lot of them were dry, or walking, or else picked up in trucks, and can't believe how dusty it was. You hardly see past the end of the hood of a vehicle. And I don't remember the mileage across there, but it was, I suppose, close to 20, 30 kilometers till we got to the Po River. And uh, I got in there at night and uh, they were, some of them, the troops had just crossed when I got there and I waited until we got some more people there. How did you cross? On uh, pontoon boats, which were put in place by the engineers. And I did get one heavy shelling incident while I was there waiting, and I was over by Italian Berry, our home, and uh, there was a little girl there, probably about three years old, and uh, they started shelling us heavily, and they were bouncing a few of those artillery shells off of this building, so I put this little girl in a, <coughs> excuse me, 
in a ditch it was right nearby and I just laid on top of her. I didn't know what else to do because there wasn't any real good protection and fortunately not, neither one of us was hit but anyway uh, the next morning we went across. She was all right. Her parents showed up about that time after and uh, so I went back to where we were based at a evening and went we were having a just a discussion of where we were going to go and how we were going to get there particularly what route we would take because they'd give me the maps and kind of on all how I was going to go to up that way and I cannot remember the name of the town right on the north side of the Po River right at the edge of the mountains there was an airfield there and we came in there one evening about eight or nine o'clock about the time we got by this airport a plane come in and landed and it was a German who was lost he did not know that we were up that far but uh, there, there was no problem he was happy to find a place to come and happy that people got him you know that kept him in a reasonable place we then proceeded on up along the east side of Lake Garda and that's where I was when the uh, we were signed up or the Germans surrendered there right in the building which I'd been staying in for two or three days and as soon as he signed then they sent another man who was spoke fluent German a little short man and myself and we were up in the, as far north as we could go through northern Italy without getting into Germany or they were still not armed up there because they had not given up the ship but we were trying to inventory wherever the Germans had left stashes of food, weapons, anything like that and that was what we did for about four days wandering around up there we didn't have any sleeping bags or anything else we and uh, of course there weren't any Americans around but this little guy from California who as far as I know may still be around he had a bookstore in I think Los Angeles by the name of Dawson was his name but he spoke fluent German and he got us through any time we ran into any troubles so and that's where we were the war ended and uh, after that our unit backed off and was down somewhere in the eastern part of Italy and as just a holding area waiting to transfer and uh, the Tito in Uruguay was getting on the sting of kind of acting up and so we were transferred back up to that line and patrolled that for about three weeks to see if he was going to be any problem and then we came back and shipped out of of uh, Naples went rode by train through that area and uh, got on it I don't remember what day that we went there but we were in the middle of the Atlantic we were in a smaller ship than what we came over in for sure and uh, but we were in the middle of the Atlantic when they dropped the first atomic bomb and we were on our way back to the States to get freshened up and we're headed to go to J the Japanese area and uh, then when we got right at the States again they dropped the second bomb or so when I was at Fort Logan Colorado when they declared peace and they I was waiting to go on leave and they wouldn't let us out that night for some reason they locked all the gates and uh, we had to stay there that night and the next morning while we did get out 
and I lived in southwestern Colorado, Monta Vista, and went there on our 30-day leave, and then came back to, since I was short of my time overseas, I had to stay in the Army for a little while. I didn't have enough points collected, so I was transferred to Lex back to Kentucky, Camp Campbell, Kentucky, and I stayed there about two months and then came back to Colorado. And was, and that ended my military career. So, but I felt very fortunate to have the opportunities that I had. And uh, I had quite a few trips when I was in Italy to various other cities, several down to Naples. One, one occasion I took our commanding colonel from our regiment and took him to Naples. He was a great guy. But uh, that's about the story of my military life. How do you think um, your time in the war with um, other soldiers like you affected your life? Oh, I mean, I think we all felt fortunate as long as we had to be there, we were in Italy because we did not have to beat the things that they had to up north in France with those terrible things in the, during the winter, you know. And we didn't have that much bad weather wherever we were. But again, no place is real good to be in war, but as, if we had to have one, why, I think we were in a good, great people. <coughs> and as you had mentioned to me, you had been over to Italy and those people really, I don't know how to explain it. They're, they're more than just happy with us. They, they totally take, you, take care of you. They're part of the group. And that's about all I can say, I guess. How did, how did you feel about the Italian people when you were there? Oh, I, I liked them very much. Uh, the northern Italian people, down when the, you get down around Naples in that area, that's another ball game. But, uh, I mean, there's nice people there, but again, they're kind of a clannish group. And, but they're, they're, the ones up north, I always felt just totally accepted by them. And, uh, and, I think it was a mutual thing. So I say they're tremendous people. How do you feel today, um, uh, having been all these years uh, a member of the 10th Mountain Division? Well, just happy to be able to. They asked today at our meeting at luncheon. They wanted the 90-year-old members to scan. Our came up to the podium. And I think there was about 16 of them that showed up who were over 90. And one of them was 96. So they're, they're kind of, the ones that are left are pretty healthy and hearty. Now, most of them have had a pretty good lifestyle, I think. They might take a little wine once in a while, but. Other than that, well, I don't think they'd do anything astray, you know, <laughs> unless they had an opportunity. How, maybe as a last question, how would you define the 10th Mountain Division? Well, there's, I'm sure there's no one, no other like it. So, camaraderie and People that like the day at this meeting, our luncheon. There, a fellow showed up and was on a ski team that I used to be on, or opposed when I was on a ski team here, in the, uh, and it, it's just hung that way. You aren't a total stranger to anybody, and they're very, very easy to visit with, and I don't. I don't find many of them that are timid either. <laughs>
but uh, just great people. And that's about all I can say. Well, thank you, Bill. It was a wonderful recollection. Wonderful recollection. I probably led some, you know, let stray some places, but uh, overall, I I thought it was just a great opportunity. And I, by being there and getting back intact, why well, I was able to come back and go to college and get out my veterinary degree. So. Senior veterinarian. Mm -hmm. That's why we wanted to be with the horses. Right. Uh -huh. So, I guess that that boils it down to the whole deal. Thank you very much. Thank you for putting up with me. Oh, not at all. It's not at all how I would say it. <laughs>